Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Strategy at Work. Today's presenter is Claudio Garcia. Claudio is the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development. He has the responsibility for Lee Hecht Harrison's business strategies and to identify sources of innovation and growth for the company. Claudio served for seven years as Executive Vice President of Latin America Operations and as President of Latin America for DBM. Claudio developed his career in a diversified range of segments such as financial industry, entertainment, media communications, and beverages in different areas from finance to operations. Claudio graduated with a degree in civil engineering and a postgraduate degree in business management. Welcome, Claudio. Welcome, welcome everybody. You know, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and just wanna say a few words about my company, just to understand uh, what we do and why uh, I'm here talking to you. So Lee Hector Harris is a global organization. We are in 64 countries. And primarily what we do is we support large organizations mainly uh, in major transformation, but in the people perspective of the transformation. You know, when you have major transformations, we have what we saw, what we say, uh, the pain, the gain. You know, uh, user transformation is looking for something that is better for the organization, or something that will uh, make the organization more competitive, different. Uh, but that comes with a lot of pain. Uh, not only because transform is challenging for people, but because there are a lot of challenges and conflicts and things that happen in the organizations. Uh, at the same time that they are looking for something better. Uh, the difference of Lee Hector Harris, and that's the reason I'm here talking to you, is we attend close to 12,000 clients uh, a year, and we support individually 400,000 individuals every year. So we have a lot of data that we collect uh, to uh, try to raise and try to understand better what the organization are doing, what they are facing, and what is helping them to succeed in this environment that we are living right now. Uh, uh, environment of a lot of transformation happening, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of instability. So what is going on in the organization? What is uh, the way they are moving? What is uh, what is succeeding right now? That's that all uh, what, uh, what the Hector Harrison do. I specifically, I run corporate development and strategy. So uh, I'm looking how we grow uh, the organization, this environment. What that means is I'm constantly uh, there are two sides of my job. One is uh, that, uh, define a strategy. The other is, okay, how we make this strategy a reality. And as uh, my corporate development uh, title says, I mean, I look for a lot of acquisitions. It could be uh, large acquisitions uh, that could put us in a better condition in a geography. Or it could be a lot of small acquisitions, both on acquisitions that can bring some product solutions that can make us uh, more competitive in the market. So we have these two sides. Uh, and other thing that my role does is all the lead, uh, all the product development, all the solution development. I have a team only take care of uh, developing uh, new uh, solutions uh, to the market, uh, to the 64 countries that we operate. And we usually choose to go this way if you don't identify any uh, acquisition that would make sense. So I'm just commenting because uh, what I'm trying to bring here is exactly what we see in our clients and what we live, the difficulties and the challenge. And that's what I, I was uh, I would try to just face. We have a title that is executing people first strategy for transformation. Uh, and you understand why I'm saying uh, people first strategy for transformation. Uh, it's a it's a slightly different uh, mindset that people don't think when they uh, think about strategy. I mean, I know that a lot of this is being discussed about strategy right now, but I mean, there is a shift that maybe we need to consider when you think how to move ahead with strategy. So. Going to the first uh, slide here, uh, it's a really important slide because uh, we always need to ask what we understand about transformation. It's something that uh, a lot of organizations don't discuss, uh, but it's really important when we define what kind of transformation you need to pass through and which are the consequences uh, for your organization. So this slide here is not new, it's something that was developed by two former McKinsey uh, consultants in 1989, I believe. Uh, as you can see here, the, 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 the sauce in the bottom. But basically they said that there are three uh, kind of uh, transformations, uh, what they call transformation that is horizon one, two, and three. 
uh, basically, if you look here in this graph, you have uh, on the X, uh, X, uh, X, so the knowledge of solutions, that is, okay, uh, how much you know a method, the process or the technology uh, that is available in the market. And in the uh, Y X, you have uh, uh, the knowledge of neither of the user or of a client. And basically, when you talk about the horizon one and two and three years, horizon one is basically when you, let's just give me a minute, let's just see, when you have like improvements, extension, uh, variance, and cost reduction. I mean, all these small uh, incremental improvements that we do uh, in organization. That comes with like this mindset of lean manufacturing, total quality management, uh, where you create groups of teams to work uh, to improve a specific input. But that exists in an area that you know. You know the process, you know the solution, you can improve the solutions. It's something that is currently uh, serving your client. So uh, there is not big new here. It's small in incremental new things in the organization. The hor horizon two, uh, 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 although is a little bit further, is something that exists in the world. Is something that you know your clients need. You and, and know, I mean, the processes, the resources are available in the market. It's just something that you don't play right now, and that will re require a learning uh, of new things that you know exist in the market. You can acquire them, you can train people, you can implement the process, you can acquire new software, but that that exists, that's proven, it's just an extension of, uh, of your market. I, I think the main concept that uh, is related in strategy to Horizon 2 is uh, a concept that came from a banking company that is called uh, Beyond uh, beyond the strategy or something uh, similar to that. That is how you expand your organization to things that exist and then can uh, create a ver vertical offering uh, to your clients or can uh, more complementary offering to your clients that you don't play today. Or even the strategic areas that you should play to protect your business and things like this. So that's horizon two. And finally, we have horizon three. The horizon three is completely different from those other two because we are talking about things that uh, it's not clearly defined in the market. We are talking about new solutions uh, that will try to address problems that and needs that you maybe you, 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 it's a hypothesis. You're trying to uh, cover something that you think it will become a, a market, an interesting market. So here you play with uncertainty. Here you're playing with things that you have an idea, you have a, a bet to do, but there is no reference. There is no reference you cannot acquire you need to develop yourself. There is a lot of uh, risks. Uh, there are a lot of uh, failures because you're trying new things. So that's the horizon tree. That's pretty much what we are seeing right now with like those big unicorns and uh, those transformations in, uh, in the technolo technological space uh, that we are seeing the last year. You know, a lot of companies come into uh, business models that we don't know if it's going to uh, work or not at the end. So I, I'm saying here uh, about those three horizons because depending what you decide to, how you decide to move ahead, you have completely different ways to move uh, for each of them. So if you think like that, uh, that's a, the project, the economists love that, the J curve, that what they say is, I mean, everything that you try to learn new things, it takes a while. I mean, at, at, usually at the beginning, you perform worse and you perform worse because you don't know how to perform with a new process or with a new product in a new industry. So it takes a while to you uh, uh, understand how to perform. You have an idea that that will bring more productivity to you in the future, and that's the way it, it, it goes. So, and of course, when you think about that, uh, what I'm saying here is there's a learning curve, but when you think about that, you're betting that investing and acquiring new capabilities so to incremental gains, you have better, better productivity, better efficiency in the future. Uh, and of course, uh, depending on the maturity of this uh, technology, if that's available, uh, you can define exactly uh, what, what you need here. So technology, which are the processes, which are the people that you need, you know, if these skills are available internal, externally, uh, if you can uh, gain those things through acquisitions, uh, so on and so forth. You know, and even the mindset, if you want to play, if there is a shift here or not. So, but if you think about this J curve, that is different when you think, let's say about the horizon one. Horizon one, incremental improvements, uh, it's quick, uh, month to few years, 
uh, quickly, you know that that will bring new productivity. There is a learning curve because people are learning things, but quickly you put there, the technology is available, the process is available, and you know how uh, the cost of development, the acquisition, you can do a business plan, a short business plan, or a business case uh, that is more uh, uh, adequate to this case. So you know which are the skills that you need, this low cost of development, it's tangible, identifiable, you know, and the mindsets, it, it are, the mindset uh, is uh, incremental. That's the pretty much like maybe that's the most well-known uh, uh, way to talk about this uh, Horizon One. That's the Toyota way. You know, people do incremental things that brought Toyota to a completely uh, new stage of uh, of competitiveness and productiveness. So that's I think is the main reference we talk to uh, Horizon One. So Horizon Two. Uh, is not that quick, you know. Even if you try to uh, go to uh, uh, an industry that you don't play, but you need to go there, you can just acquire a company. But to acquire a company means you need to integrate the company. It takes like few too many years to do that. Uh, if you are going to develop by yourself, the same, you know. But you know that the technology is available and somehow accessible. It can be expensive, but it's there. The same about the process, about the skills. I mean, they are available as well, uh, and. Uh, Maybe it can be sometimes disputed uh, because we have other organizations that want to acquire them. So maybe you can, like today, uh, when you go to AI or uh, some areas of technology, the skills are there. I mean, some of them are there, but they are quite expensive, but they're there. You know what to do, you know what you need to hire. And the mindset here is a paradigm shift sometimes. You need to operate with a different paradigm uh, and that will require some uh, transformation management or cultural uh, uh, management, uh, things that are required more efforts. But here's a, the best example, I would say. I mean, GE, I mean, if you look like how GE expanded the business uh, along like 30, 40 years, uh, acquiring companies, investing in new sectors, verticalizing some sectors, going from uh, manufacturing to services to, in, to banking. So uh, the, I think GE is, is what represents the best uh, for a uh, model for what we are talking about the Horizon 2. They knew they already existed. Uh, they had some innovation, of course, but they knew they already existed. They went there and acquired those companies and invested in new uh, technology that were there. Now Horizon 3. You know, Horizon 3 is, as I said, take, uh, it could take many years. It's difficult to know. I mean, there's some Horizon 3 that were successful in a few years, but most of the case, we are talking about a long time here of investing, trying new things, because you don't know exactly what is the technology, low maturity, intangible. I mean, uh, sometimes high cost development, the same about the process operation is emerging. It's not defined yet. You need to invest to define them. Uh, the skills, I mean, the skills are scarce in the market. You know, when you think about blockchain, all the revolution blockchain can play in, in logistics and uh, currency in a lot of plays. Uh, until two years ago, the, the only available consulting, three years ago, only available consulting in blockchain was a group of students from Stanford. We we're talking about like 10 people that were like venturing in uh, develop applications uh, for blockchains. So in the mindset here is disruptive. We are talking about a completely different way to go. And that's the reason most of those uh, Horizon 3 things come from organizations that are completely out of the mainstream's organization right now. Because sometimes it's just difficult to make people think in a completely different way. So, I mean, some examples that I can bring here, I mean, Uber, WeWork, or Slack, for example. And what's interesting is all those companies are still uh, betting that they will be successful. I mean, none of them, of those three companies, is profitable, are profitable. None of them are profitable yet. They are still believing that their model will succeed somehow in the future. I mean, the only case here that I include here that some of them get, get there like the Airbnb. Airbnb is profitable, is a model that's proven and expanding and impacted their uh, other competitors, traditional players in hotels and other uh, kind of uh, chains. So, but it's, a, it's something that requires sometimes a lot of cash to make sure, uh, to, to try and to uh, make sure you can get su success in the future. So uh, come back here to the three horizons, you know, the big challenge today, uh, even for those companies playing Horizon 1 and 2 is, Horizon 3 is creating a lot of references that the clients, customers are getting to the conversation with Horizon 1 and 2, uh, two companies. 
I can give you a short example. Like when you think about Amazon that did a lot of on Horizon 3, uh, create like the whole infrastructure in e-commerce. It's, I mean, if you go to the Walmart or any other competitor in retail, you want to have the same experience as Amazon. Or in any other industry, uh, when they, uh, they disrupt the sector, what happened is you go to other competitors in the traditional models or, or uh, similar services, you expect the same level of service, you expect the same innovation. So what's happening right now is that Horizon 3 is making more difficult to Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 to innovate and to grow strategically. And the point is when they try to do that, they, are, they have a really big question mark. That is how we do that because it's nothing or it's something that is not completely available in the market. So what that means is most of the organizations are moving uh, to Horizon 3 by pressure uh, for survival because even if a company Horizon 3 is not profitable, it's creating a completely different reference of an experience that will impact the other providers. So what exactly is the challenge here? So basically, I mean, if you look at strategy, the main mindset is still predominant uh, in the market is you do a strategy design, you know what you want, and uh, you create your talent strategy lead. So, and when you define your talent strategy, def define a competence model, organizational culture for your, you define your, what's your culture. You say, okay, I need to bring people that fit with my culture so I can gain synergy speed. Uh, so I don't have uh, entropy uh, in, uh, under my organization. So I need to focus on the engagement. But the challenge is if you wanna think in Horizon 3, if you have an organization, you need to think about the future. You're talking about, uh, thinking about something that you don't know. As I said, it's a big question mark. It's moving to an uncertain future. And that's more what we're seeing in the organization right now. You don't draft your strategy, you draft this, an intention and you try to move to this intention in a discovery process, in a discovery journey process where you iterate with the market and you see what works and what doesn't work. And you try to improve. And at the end, you get something that you didn't imagine in the beginning. So it's much more like, uh, uh, iterative, as I said, then something that you know what to do from the beginning. Uh, when you see like big companies like Tesla, or even like right now, uh, companies that are trying to venture in this space of autonomous vehicles, uh, is uh, they always delay the, the when they are going to launch because as they move, they discover a lot of new things that they didn't think uh, it would be possible. It could be policy, it could be uh, uh, logistic barriers, uh, technological barriers. So that's the process that the organization has. Instead of that, what we are seeing a movement and uh, methodologies like agile uh, management, agile uh, development, uh, design thinking are helping is the other side is having the uh, talent strategy uh, first before uh, doing the design of the strategy. What is happening is, and that was said by Henry Mitzbach, in 1992, uh, with the rise and fall of strategic planning, organizations should stop like thinking about the strategy thinking and uh, be, uh, be more concerned about the strategy making. So you do the strategy as you iterate with the market, with your customers, with your clients. So it's, that's a completely different model because that puts uh, what you need to define about the strategy uh, before we, you're moving ahead. You don't know exactly which are the skills you need in the future, but you need to start thinking before that. And I can comment, uh, most of you have, uh, have, have seen before that a lot of people say diversity is important, diversity creates like more different point of views. Uh, and that's true. I mean, the diversity I'm trying to use right now when I see uh, when I say about the things is not specifically about uh, gender, race, or other kind of diversity that are important as well. There are a lot of social and, and important things that are important here, but I, I'm talking more about having people with completely different backgrounds uh, that can help organizations think about the a future that they don't know. It's bring completely uh, views of the world to the table. So, and when you think about that, we have a different way to think about talent. It's not a big, talent strategy is not something that you define when you have the strategy design. Is you need to have a way to move forward before that because this talent strategy will make you successful with strategy making. So we are talking about here uh, the cultural diversity absorption. I mean, here the rule is 
what's my capability as an organization to absorb as as much diversity as possible uh, of course uh, in a comment later that's quite challenging because if you create too much diversity of uh, how people think about the world you can't create a lot of entropy in the organization so how much diversity your organization can be taught that's an important point second is balancing polarities there will be always uh, polarities in place there there will be always ambiguity in place in how organization blends that so it's a different approach it's not like forcing people to align is uh, is is helping polarities different point of views to survive together there's a completely different mindset as well and instead of like uh, manage only talent engagement and the culture of organization and i will comment more is about maturity how you keep maturity in the organization uh, uh, moving forward so what i call here is this kind of approach you it's an approach that you force into the organization what i call intentional ambiguity is you create ambiguity because you know that this ambiguity some of uh, these polarities will be important for you in the future. You just don't know when and how. So moving forward uh, to the next uh, slide. So all we are talking here is how we enlarge the framing capabilities of organizations to handle with unknown, you know, we handle with uncertainty, with the things they don't know. And the second thing is reduce the cost of learning. Because if any time you face a problem in, when you're doing your strategy, when you're making your strategy, if you don't have capabilities to think differently uh, and think uh, innovatively to solve this problem, you increase your cost of learning. All what we are seeing here is how we speed the cost of learning of the organization through uh, enlarging the framing capabilities. So good example here, uh, recently we were helping a big health insurance company. And as, as some of you know, health insurance is all about like the policy issues, management, the claims, the actuar actuarial, uh, all the, uh, the medical support to see if the things uh, are happening or not, or what is possible to cover or not, underwriting. So all these traditional things that is a paradigm, uh, that is a paradigm of control. You know, I give what I can do and I control you, and there's a culture if I don't trust you. I mean, everything you send, I need to send to my team here so they can check that the things are working. And what we are seeing right now in the organization is uh, in uh, insurance companies is that that's not sustainable uh, long term. There is a big problem here that is people will not behave the way you want. They will try to find out uh, ways to uh, manipulate you, to deceive you, and to get the best service uh, that they need. Uh, not the best service, but the best uh, amount of money to do what they need uh, uh, from the health insurance company. So, and what some companies did was they start like bringing. Uh, so behavioral scientists, people that are experts to engage clients, not to, it's funny, not to engage clients in the services, but engage clients in, in consume insurance services in a way that long term will be much more sustainable and less expensive. And also, I mean, to do that, they saw that they need to bring people to take care of data privacy because they couldn't do that in any country that they operate. They should, I mean, doing this to collect information from people, they need to be careful about that. But at the moment they do that, they start like creating the ambiguity. Okay, short-term cash management on long-term uh, ROI. Because if you wanna change people to have a behavior to consume differently your products and your insurance, what that means is uh, that effect will be long-term. It will be not affecting your bottom line right now. How do you survive that? That creates a lot of tension in the organization, different ways of thinking. Oh, uh, should I manage deals when I go to a client? Uh, should I go there to an RFP and just get my best price and make sure that the client is paying something that can cover my claims in the future? Oh, I should engage the client in a relationship that will be completely different, is long-term, and it will be uh, generate benefits for both sides. So. Uh, the full model in the left side is restrictions and the left, the right side is incentives, how you incentive people to behave different. So that's, these are completely different words. And when you create that in the organization, like this health insurance company, you create a lot of tension that need to be managed. And all that they, they, they need to do is how we keep those two things because one is not replacing the other. They just need to survive together. 
So moving forward, uh, the challenge as well is when you think about diversity is how red are individuals in the organization to handle that? And I, I did once like this uh, quick exercise with uh, a lot of people. I, I will not do here. Uh, we don't have uh, the, uh, the time to do that here. But basically, I, I, I launched these four uh, situations here. Uh, oh, sorry, the six uh, situations. Actually, the situation is people need to relate better with each other. And different six different peoples, A, B, C, D, E, F, they have their own point of view about how relationship happens. And if you look here, you have different levels of maturity. If you look to the C, for example, uh, or the E, people can be useful when manipulating and controlling to generate benefits for me. What suggests a really low level of maturity but when you look to the C that says, I'm responsible for my choice, relationships to have with others, uh, people and the interdependence we have with everyone around us. I hope I can help them to develop the, few, uh, the full potential in the future. So much more maturity here than in the latter year. But what's interesting and what science has shown us that is, is not easy. There is a first, there is a, a, a levels of maturity. Let's say someone that is in the, uh, First stage here, uh, that was the letter E. Uh, don't get immediately if trained or developed in the letter C. They pass through levels. They pass through levels of maturity until they get to the level C. So each level brings more maturity to the table and make them more effective to work together with people and uh, uh, bring outputs to the organization. And that takes time. You know, it's funny because a, a, a researcher uh, from the Harvard uh, University, her name is Susanne Kugruter, uh, she did this uh, research with more than uh, 20,000 executives in different organizations. And she found out that actually there are a lot of people in lower stages of maturity. If you look like uh, one E here, 11.3% of people were here, 29.7% in the, the third level. So a long way to the most mature, mature level that is the C. So it takes time to get there. So, but organizations need to move forward if they want people with diverse backgrounds to work together. If they don't do that, I mean, uh, they will uh, just create a lot of uh, complexity uh, to those people manage the diversity in the organization and they will struggle. So that's much more than inclusion. I mean, you need to make inclusion happen, but you need to create the level of emotional maturity in people to make them work together. So I will skip this slide here uh, that shows a little bit of this challenge of uh, organizations should move forward from horizon one and horizon three and that uh, when you think about leadership, structure and performance, we are talking about completely different ways to look to the organization. But my final point, and we can go to some of the questions is what should organizations do about that? So, and I, hear, I have a few suggestions based on your experience. The first one is uh, develop intentionally diversity. What I mean is, uh, which are the areas, instead of like just saying, I need diversity and bring people to your organization, the point is, which are the areas that I need people thinking differently? It's like bringing more behavioral scientists, they bring more economists, they bring anthropologists, bring people from technology, bringing artists uh, to help you with like uh, different employee experience. So which are the areas that I, I need intentionally uh, to bring to my organization? But don't uh, get fooled. That will bring ambiguity. Uh, that will bring complexity and polarity to the organization. The second point uh, that I would suggest is expand, do not narrow. Cultural capabilities should be solved different. So all the investments you need to do in your teams, your existing teams, is how they will accept the, the, the different and the, the, how they will uh, hire, engage, and keep the, the different work in the organization. Because the cultural fit, that, that would make sense for the horizon one and two, but that create a lot of uh, problems to organization. That when the different was bought, I mean, everybody knows that when you brought the different to your organization, what happened? I mean, those people were expelled because they didn't have the cultural fit. I mean, that's an excuse that is not more uh, acceptable. I mean, you need to be able to absorb the different. And that means uh, that not all organizations have this capability mature and they need to develop that. The third point is develop and measure maturity of individuals, teams and organizations. Instead of only be concerned with employee engagement and if people are happy and if they are uh, seeing career, you need to make sure that they're uh, getting more mature 
mainly in the relationships with others. So few organizations measure that and they should be more concerned. And I put here a really important point to be careful that is sometimes when you're transforming, you create more conflict. Sometimes the conflict is a sign uh, is a sign that you are moving to the right direction. Of course, you need to be careful because uh, ex extreme conflict can create, as I said, entropy and can make you not uh, move forward. So, but the point here is sometimes the employee engagement tools or uh, employee satisfaction service, they just create the misperception that you need to solve those problems. And actually those problems don't need to be solved. They just need to be, uh, people need to learn how to live with that. And that's something that you should be aware of and be careful. And the big but here at the end, uh, and the final point uh, that I would suggest that is, uh, do not create more complexity. I mean, as I said, you bring more diversity, you create more complex in the organization. Uh, but what are you saying, Claudio? I mean, it seems paradoxical. The point is, I mean, you should choose every time you bring more complexity, uh, the informal complexity of the of people in your organization, you should do something to simplify what is formal. And today you have a lot of technologies that are helping you to make more effective things that create a lot of friction in the organization and helps nothing. Like uh, all, everything that's formal, uh, processes, uh, simple decisions that you need to make, uh, make the governance work. Uh, if you could automate that as, 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 as quicker as possible, it's better uh, to leave uh, the, the, the amount of uh, capability to handle with complexity free to the formal side. So uh, everything that should be, uh, is political in some organizations should be formalized and uh, simplify the lives of a lot of people that we will spend more time in the future, talk to each other, try to convince each other, try to work together and bring new things uh, to, to the table and try to have the organization live in a more, I would say, horizon one, oh, sorry, horizon three uh, kind of world. So that is, is my message today. Of course, uh, I will uh, respond to some questions if, if you have some. I will look here. I hope you have enjoyed. Uh, that's my message to most of you. Okay, so now we are going to start our Q&A portion of the presentation. Just as a quick reminder, if you do have any questions for Claudio, please do type them into the questions pane of your control panel, which is located down at the very bottom of your control panel. And it looks like our first question is, can you explain more on how strategic thinking is a talent and what would you, or what would we specifically look for? Could you repeat the, the beginning of the question? Is strategic thinking is a talent? Explain more on how strategic thinking is a talent. What would we specifically be looking for? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, I mean, the, the premise is, uh, if you move from strategic thinking to strategic making, uh, it's not that you're ignoring uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, and focusing the making. No, it's just that you're using the thinking uh, to realize things, to take decisions more on the go as the things unfold, as the things is, uh, are uh, forming. So that's not a talent that can be training. You know, I mean, everybody should be training about like how to handle with a, a certain future. When you see all those new methodologies like design thinking and agile development, they, they, their premise, the premise is we don't know exactly what is going to work in the end. We have an intention and we move forward and we strategically connect with each other to make decisions as we go. And what that means is we still need to look to the market with the, what the competitors are doing, what the science is saying about that, what the economies are doing. You need to use all the, your strategic thinking capabilities. But the difference here is, is not to design something that you don't know will succeed. It should give response to what you design right now that you need to go back to the market, to your clients and test it. That's a different way to think about that. So what I say usually is uh, if you're uh, person in strategy, you should have big intentions, but don't be concerned to have a really big plans. Have just a beginning of a plan uh, that could put you moving and make sure that people are discussing and bring the questions 
that need to be decided and need to be tested in the market uh, to move forward. So and have so many tools that are available today that can allow you to do that. So all those comp concepts of minimal viable product, you know, and as I said, agile thinking, agile uh, design thinking, uh, all those things uh, can train people and form the talent on people that will deliver uh, on those projects. Uh, that's another shift that I didn't comment here, but when you think about strategy making, there is a, a distribution of the strategy function from a, a, an area that used to be the traditional organizations to the field. You equip people to make decisions there, giving them information, giving them access to other people, uh, giving the, the support that they need to uh, move forward with decisions they need to make. So that's trainable. Maybe there are some people that have more skills to do that than others. Uh, what I think is more difficult is the mindset, because when you try to implement that, you need to have people much more flexible to handle the leadership to other people uh, the, that are, are not formal leaders in organization. Usually the leadership in this space is more fluid. You give the leadership who, to whoever, whoever uh, has the best capability to lead the team at this moment to a specific problem and so on and so forth. So uh, it changed the whole dynamic of uh, how you manage organizations. Okay, let's go to the second question. Seems there is another one. Perfect, thank you. How would you define ambiguity? It is a, is it the gap that you have from taking the organization from point A to point B? No, yes, no, I don't think so. I think ambiguity means that you're leading with things that uh, cannot, uh, you cannot solve. Uh, let's say, I mean, if an organization uh, is leading with short term and long term, for example, uh, sometimes you cannot solve this problem or you take an action that will solve your short term problems or you take an action that will prepare you for the future. But this ambiguity exists there. And, and what happens is when you have an ambiguity, sometimes you need to favor one side uh, against the another. Uh, I can give an example. If you're an organization and you know that you need to take some actions for the long term, uh, and I'm just giving one example, but you know, if you do that, you put your company in a really uh, difficult cash position, you should maybe tend uh, to take the short term uh, decision. So the ambiguity is there, you know, and people will complain that you're not taking uh, the future and that will uh, diminish your capabilities to play in the future. But there's a point here that you need to make a decision. That is, if I do that, I can uh, uh, put in risk the survival of the organization in the short term. That's a, a simple example that I, I you, you have seen a lot of organizations live there, but there's so many of the, those polarities that you cannot solve simply saying, oh, it's one and another. Uh, no, you need to live with two of them. You need to, uh, uh, in some organizations, live with competencies, capabilities that are the opposite of each other. And you need as a leader or as an organization to be able to manage to sometimes give more force to one of them and less force to other of them. You know, so another example is like this capability. I mean, you have people that are really good in designing, operating, and you have really good, good people in innovating. I mean, sometimes you need to balance to one uh, and the others will uh, complain. You know? so that's what I mean about ambiguity is when you have those values or uh, capabilities, competencies that are really polarities, that they cannot uh, be solved and you need to live with them uh, in the organization. And that creates a big problem for those that advocate that culture is a, a set of values and behaviors that everybody should have in the organization. That's a lie. I mean, if you want to survive in the future, you need to have these conflicts alive in organizations. You just, the point is, uh, instead of making those conflicts negative, you need to have the maturity to make them uh, uh, survive in your organization. Because in the future, maybe you need one uh, instead of another, and that can revert in the next year or so. So that's challenging, but that's what we are seeing organizations, how we have uh, those uh, people uh, conflicting respectfully and make decisions together, understand that sometimes one of them will be more important than the other, in order to make the organization flexible enough to create and to thrive in this new uh, uncertain and unstable market that we are living right now. Great, thank you, Claudio. 
Um, our next question, uh, the, the asker would like to thank you for an interesting presentation. And their question is, I am trying to apply this to nonprofit sector organizations and strategic planning. There's a lot of cultural diversity in my client's organization, but staff very ingrained in nonprofit sector. Salaries yeah. in the sector tend to be below the for profit for profit sector. How do we encourage diversity as you referred to with nonprofit sector strategy implementation that is level two and level three? Yeah, I think that uh, it's funny. Uh, NGOs are all the time trying to handle with problems that are difficult to solve. Uh, it's funny when you see Melinda Gates uh, Foundation the, uh, that they have invested billions and billions in, of dollars in Africa. And most recently, like a few years ago, uh, Melinda came to Melinda Gates came to see that Unfortunately, a lot of investments they did in the past, they just didn't work. They had the intention, they believed that investing this way would solve uh, problems in education, in this, uh, disease control, you know, uh, uh, but it didn't solve. Why? Because all those problems uh, were like being, try, uh, being tried to solve for the first time. So you cannot just go to a solution. And they are now much more flexible how they approach those problems instead of uh, just go there, invest in a problem with a specific solution. They are trying small, a lot of small solutions because they know that one of them will work and they can scale that. And sometimes they will try to scale and not work because what works, let's say, in Mozambique is not going to uh, be the same in Kenya because of cultural differences. But what I'm saying here is that NGOs are trying to solve, a lot of them are trying to, prov uh, to solve complex problems in the world and they are maybe the ones that most require uh, the most require the diversity of thinking because they constantly need to rethink their solutions they need to think if what they are doing is working if it's not what would be the next option and unfortunately what the, the areas that they play there's not a lot of people playing so there's not a lot, not a lot of options so they need to constantly innovate and find uh, and pursue different approach to solve their problems, if you can understand. I mean, if you look like the amount of things, uh, and I'm, of course, uh, thinking about NGOs, uh, of those organizations that are trying to solve problems that the uh, formal marketplace uh, do not have uh, interest to go. So if you think about this way, uh, you need to be really innovative to create efficient uh, ways to uh, solve uh, the problems uh, you're facing as an NGO. So I really believe that's completely uh, applicable to, 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 to them. Okay, and our next question is, so in the bottom, you were saying that organizations need to change from Ansoft to Mitzberg for designing strategy? Yes, and uh, what I'm saying is organizations uh, should design the strategies as they go. You know, they should create, uh, it's more like a uh, scientific approach, you know, is I have this idea, I have this intention, this is what the organization could go uh, move forward. Let's encapsulate that, put a group of people, a diverse group of people, try this in the market, check if it, it's working out, check the feedback from the market and uh, is slowly scale this strategy as you move forward. Instead, in, instead of uh, as you used to do in the past, that is here, huge discussion about strategy. We define completely what's the future of the organization and we create a really comprehensive plan how to execute on it. I, I'm just saying that, that that's impossible today because it's funny because we see that all the time. Organizations call big consulting companies. They do like those three year plan, which let's say, and that creates like uh, uh, the, 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 the sub products of implement a system, a software, and people start implementing those softwares and systems one year from the beginning. Everybody knows it's not going to solve anything. And at the end, nobody has the political uh, power to raise the hand and say, you know, we are just investing here. We just could, should uh, get the sunk cost and invest something else. What I'm trying to say is avoid that. I mean, what I'm trying to say is just have a good intention what you want to do with your organization and put people, smart people to work together uh, 
thinking strategically how to solve the problem, but as they go, instead of like having the full plan in place. Great, thank you, Claudio. Our next question is, in your experience, which horizon are most large companies in? Yeah, what I'd say is, uh, and that creates a lot of ambiguity as well, but they are playing the, all the three horizons. You still, you, all organizations still need horizon one, incremental improvement. Everybody needs to uh, incrementally improve their efficiency, new ideas, solutions. Uh, the same horizon two, I mean, uh, bigger corporation, large corporations are still acquiring different companies, different sectors, investing areas, uh, and they need to do that to survive. If you look like to the disruptors, uh, some of them are uh, not only working in one sector, they're a multi sector. You know, if you think, for example, Amazon, Amazon is a marketplace, is, uh, is the distributor of their own products, is now having their own stores. It's so, his is the supplier, he's the, uh, the retail place, you know, it's everything together. So, Horizon two, 2 will always happen in organizations, but it's, it's a little easier than Horizon 3. But uh, organizations, and you, we, you, we can see, I mean, uh, all those examples that organizations took from the last year that they don't want to be the next Kodak, uh, the next blockbuster, because other can disrupt them. So they are trying to innovate by themselves. They are going to Horizon 3. And that creates a lot of tension. Uh, I can give you one example. I mean, maybe uh, a lot of you followed uh, what happened with GE. Uh, GE, uh, last year, GE was, uh, well, the first time after like uh, many years out of the Dow Jones index, uh, it was excluded from the Dow Jones index. Uh, and all of you have followed in the media uh, what happened with G. But basically, uh, G in 2012, 2011 said, I will be digital first. Digital first is I need to innovate and completely change the way we operate as an organization for, to survive in the future. And they tried to do that, but they just ignored the, if you think this way, horizon two and one. That is, there was still a profitable organization behind them uh, that they need to take care of. And what that means is you can play in all organizations, large organizations are trying to play in the horizon three, but there is still like people working there that want to be excited to go every day to the work and I believe that they are doing a great job. And it seems that like uh, a lot of reports say that in GE, people were really saying, the the golden ducks were always like taking care of the innovation in the future and what they were doing were not more important for the organization they create like there was the ambiguity as i said but they were not able to make this ambiguity live together and say hey you're that taking care of the horizon two and horizon one businesses that we have today are as important as the investments we we're doing to become the digital uh, uh, first in the future and that create a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary risk and people uh, didn't keep like the improvements and the horizon to uh, alive in GE, what reduces profitability and other things. And they were not successful. They went too big to the horizon three, much more like a big plan instead of an emerging process that they would bring new solutions uh, slowly, uh, uh, slowly to, to the market, uh, proving them and scaling them. And that created a really big problem to them that they are trying to uh, escape from right now but i would say that all big companies they are in the three horizons at the same time they need to be careful and that creates a lot of ambiguity and diverse ways to face the problems uh, in organizations and leaders uh, of those organizations need to be able to keep all of them living together great thank you claudio and just as a reminder, there is still time. If you do have any questions for Claudio, please do type them into the questions pane that is located at the bottom of your control panel. And our next question is, what is your experience with flat organization efficiency? Flat organizations, what's the last word? Efficiency. Oh, yes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh... In the last 10 years, uh, I've seen a lot of organizations uh, try to venture themselves in more uh, innovative structures uh, like holacracy and other things. And we have some clients in this field. Uh, and one thing is there is a trend 
and the trend is organizations become uh, more and more flat as the, they automate more services, they reduce uh, uh, constraint and, 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 and the friction in the process. So as automation moves forward, we will have more uh, organizations more, uh, more flat and that will, uh, it, it's a trend. But there are organizations that try to move that quickly, uh, going to a flat structure quickly and uh, I would say that my experience say that that's quite difficult because we are talking about that slide that I showed that people take long time to get the maturity to operate in this level of environment. And sometimes they don't have just, they just don't have the maturity to play there. If it's a small team, like there's a really interesting case in Brazil of a company uh, that was a, a successful book in US the name of the book is Mavericks. Uh, I forgot the name of the company. Uh, and they were quite successful in creating a flat organizations where everybody were listed uh, before a decision was made. Uh, but when you look to the size of the company, we are talking about 300 people. You know, and they, they were smart enough that they had a cap. The organization could not uh, grow bigger than a specific size. And if they uh, saw the possibility to grow bigger than this specific size, they would split the organization. So they could keep like a, a lower amount of people in this flat organization that could operate. But the point is they needed to have a really high level of maturity. Again, you know, you can have flat organizations, yeah, but as organizations become more flat right now, you need to invest in the maturity of your workforce. You need to have uh, invest in make those people work together uh, and make the best decision that sometimes is better for some people because they will have more compelling exciting work than the others and the other moment will be the different i mean there's so many uh uh behaviors that people need to comply to get the maturity it just take time you people are not digital people are analogic they take time to develop so i believe in flat organizations I just believe it takes time to develop the maturity necessary to make them work Perfect, thank you so much, Claudia. And our next question is, according to you, what is the most critical skill set organizations should look for today? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's, it's pretty much like, uh, uh, they, there was a phrase that I said that that is, uh, I can come back there because it's uh, what I really believe that companies uh, should do is simplify the formal and the strength the informal. It's this last phrase here, uh, what I'm saying here at the end is that the organizations uh, should quickly uh, automate everything that is formal, that uh, it's easy to automate. I mean, you have to the robot process of, uh, automation that could speed your process to even uh, automate legal or there is that are more formal, you know what to do. Uh, and when I say strengthening formal is, strengthen the capability of people living with what is the most human uh, things we have on us that is, uh, is strengthen the capabilities of people to, to, to conflict with each other, the capabilities of people to convince each other. It's all about human capabilities. It's about soft skills. I think that's the main thing that organizations should invest right now uh, for the future. Of course, they cannot forget all the uh, technical skills, many of those that are really important for the future of, of the organization, uh, that is uh, all these, uh, artificial intelligence, data science, all those things need to come together, but they don't work if those people that are joining are not capable to have productive conversations and make tough decisions together. So that for me is the key skills, a key skill that we make organizations learn fast, faster because learning fast, faster is not about like Peter Sainz said in the past, uh, organization that will bring a lot of knowledge for the organization is much more about how we go to the market together and know what, what we work for our clients and not. And to do that, we need to abandon a lot of childish, childish behaviors, you know, and invest more in how to gain maturity and uh, how we can work better together to make the best decisions uh, uh, for our company, for our clients. I think that's it. Great, thank you. And our final question for you today is, what is a good example of a flat organization? Yeah, this is a good, it's a good question. I mean, I can uh, send the name to the participants leader of this company in Brazil that have a, uh, 
real flat organization or flat uh, operation. I can tell you organizations that are moving in this direction. I cannot tell a, if you were talking about large or mid-sized organization, I, I know, I don't know any of them that's completely flat. I can tell some of them that have more flat environments than others. Uh, if you look like most of those uh, digital companies uh, that are becoming unicorn right now, they are exactly in this moment that they were much flatter. And now they are trying uh, to live with this flat environment in a much bigger corporation. They are not succeeding, but they are examples of doing this. Uh, there's always the example of Zappos at Amazon, but there's a lot of criticism about that. What I can tell you is that there are big organizations that are more flat, flat than others uh, in the same field. But if you ask me about a completely flat organization, large organizations, I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen yet. Great. Thank you, Claudio. And thank you so much for such an interesting presentation today. That is all the questions we have. So I'll turn things over to you to wrap things up for us. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. I mean, you have my contact uh, information here. So any uh, personal contact or any uh, extension of this conversation, if you want to have, uh, uh, more than glad to, to connect. So I'm based in New York. I'm always traveling, but I, 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 I find some time to spend, stay here in the city. So if you, some of you are traveling here or if you live here, don't hesitate to connect with me. Maybe you can have a coffee and discuss more of the things. Those things excite me. I mean, I'm not in this job because I'm, uh, uh, I, I just uh, got here. I like what I do. So everything that could uh, increase my uh, comprehension of what's going on and how we uh, can react to them uh, would, would be really helpful. So more than glad to connect with you. So thank you so much, Brightline, for this opportunity. And uh, I hope all of you have a great week.